begin with a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. St. Joseph, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, um, today we begin, I think. No? Uh oh. There you go. Okay. Today we begin the final chapter of this book. Um, okay. There we go. Chapter 10 is the um, final chapter of this book by Brumley on how not to share our faith. This last week we were talking about the transition from all the uh, mistakes and the vices that we uh, make as apologists. And again, how do we combat that and how do we try to become effective um, apologists by adopting these habits? So. Just quickly, um, from what we know already, um, we see the non-effective um, vices being gluttony, uh, taking off too much, material being over our head. Argumentativeness is um, just there are people that like to argue. And again, it's reducing everything that we have to propose for the church um, into an argument rather than just a discussion. Personal immorality, again, we're speaking for the church, and so again, uh, a personal life should be uh, in order, but at the same time, it doesn't affect the truth that the church holds, even if the person is sinful. Uh, contentiousness has to deal with condemning others for what they believe in. Again, we have to remember that they're born that way, they've grown up in a custom, in a country, or whatever, a tradition, and they've adopted those things as being the truth. They know no other way, just like Catholics may not know another way. So again, um, rather than condemning, it's important that we try to find out where they're from and what they believe in, and then we can try to invite them into our church. Friendly fire is not knowing who the enemy is. Again, sometimes we like to pick arguments with um, non-Catholics, um, but we have to remember that non-Catholics and Jews and Muslims believe in many things that we believe in with regard to morality. So to shoot them in friendly fire is not our goal. The purpose of um, the ultimate purpose is to fight against uh, agnosticism and secularism. Again, triumphalism is the need to win, again, at any cost. We, some people just have to be the answer to all the arguments. And again, um, we're willing to win at any cost without really listening to the subject matter. And then uh, pride, again, was the vice of arrogant dismissiveness and realizing human disagreements are an art of life and we do not need to presume others to be at fault. So we need a great deal of humility. But today we're being introduced to the effective um, seven in, uh, habits that can help us do better in being apologists. Again, these aren't um, all the total, but they are seven that were brought together in this book to show us ways in which we can be better apologists. First one is prayer. I'm not going to be reading all the stuff that's on the board there for you, but um, sort of supplementing what's there. So, uh, to combat the seven vices, we uh, we need to develop seven virtues to keep from falling into the pit of um, being ineffective. The first one offered is prayer. As we see, it's essential. Uh, connects us to God and truth. Uh, prayer keeps us from pride. It's a knowledge of God and truth and keeps us from error. And, uh, and also calls us to be a sacramental people. So we can pray, pray, pray in that way. And again, um, it's not an option. So uh, coming into uh, this kind of uh, intellectual knowledge requires prayer and to have an experience of God. We have to have that experience of God before we talk about him. So the, to teach of the truth implies that we have this knowledge and experience of God as truth. 
And also, um, sin helps us. Um, prayer helps us to avoid the sin of pride. So again, it's humbly coming before God, recognizing that he has all the answers. Ring a bell? Anybody study look like that? Mine does. Second effective um, virtue is that of um, study. Prayer is not enough. Uh, we also have to study. So it talks about <coughs> continued ongoing study is required to be effective in any field. Whatever field we're in, we need to continue to be updated all the time. We need to be cautious here against excessive curiosity beyond what we need to know. Sometimes when people get into a subject matter, they, they just pursue it, pursue it, pursue it, and then they just um, lose track of what they were trying to uh, initially accomplish. So the apologist should study what he needs to know before he studies what he likes. Okay, so we need to clearly um, set the boundaries for the argument. We uh, must also avoid ridicule uh, to ourselves and those we represent in our arguments. So again, going over our head, not knowing what we're talking about, uh, we have to ask ourselves, do I solemnly have rational grounds for what I say about the doctrine? There's a danger in study as well that we have to be cautious of, and that is getting over one's head. So again, a deeper form of prayer is meditation. It comes, um, again, it comes under study because um, prayer can be anything. It could be public prayer, it could be uh, special prayers at mass, it could be um, private prayer, but meditation is a study in itself. And again, meditation uh, is, brings us into the presence of God on an intellectual level. And again, it arouses a love for God and uh, response to the truth revealed in the intellect. So through deep meditation and prayer, um, again, it's deeper and different from just general prayer, but it's also, a, um, you know, prayer in particular, but it comes under study here. So again, meditation is very necessary as well. The next section, third one, is dialogue. Okay, um, this is not occasional conversation, but a habitual inclination to discuss and truly discuss. Okay, dialogue puts the study into action. Okay, so all the stuff that we've studied in our head and, and privately now goes into action during the dialogue itself. So we need to listen attentively to what the other person's faith beliefs are and what they mean to them. Dialogue can help an apologist do his job better. So, the, you know, having this uh, ability to dialogue uh, about salvation, we need to realize it was God that initiated the whole process of um, inviting man into his love. And it's completed by God. So again, the boundaries of keeping um, this focused on God and seeing that he is the main agent behind it all. We are called to engage in this dialogue for the salvation of all. But remember charity as a mode of operandi. So again, charity must be the bottom line in which we discuss with other people in dialogue. Um, again, not being too flippant about our own faith, but also we're trying to achieve the salvation of all. It has to be our desire to bring everybody under the faith and following God. So um, we slow down, biting off a little rather than too much in each encounter. So again, dialogue allows us to set the boundaries. Um, we don't have to solve the whole world in one discussion. Um, it didn't happen all in one day. So again, um, we've got to keep those boundaries in the dialogue rather than going off on too many um, issues, whether it be the Blessed Mother or the Pope or Bible or whatever it might be, Rather than trying to discuss them all in one hour, cut off. Have a dialogue maybe on just the Bible or just Mary or whatever. Other virtues that we can use during this section, section is meekness, trust, and prudence. And um, the whole purpose of dialogue is not to be um, displeasing or incomprehensible, which brings us to the next 
virtue. It's that of clarity. Okay, one must be clear about what one means. We make peace and we put aside differences, think them by charity. Don't let them become the bubbling agent for an argument. Clarity of thinking is necessary. One who cannot explain clearly does not have a grasp of the subject matter. And again, our ultimate goal is unity and salvation for all. Pope Paul VI says that a man must be first understood and where he merits it, agreed with. Seems simple enough. The apostle's art is therefore a risky one. We need not paper over our differences, which can in turn be more harmful. Clarity in things lead, uh, in speaking, clarity in speaking leads to that unity, and we don't water down our arguments just for the sake of getting along spirituality. We know we have compromised too much sometimes and just to get along. So again, uh, we have to be careful of that. <clears throat> the three uh, theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity, seem like a given as far as um, being part of the Christian apologetic um, field. But at the same time, they are included here. Um, just to realize their um, importance and how we have to pray for these. These come from God. Any theological, um, the word theological has to deal with man's thinking about God, how he experiences him. So it's through faith, hope, and love that we experience God in these virtues. So, um, in faith here, we see it's the first one. Um, what faith does is a... Um, avoids the uh, set of propositions in mere philosophy of life. Again, we just can't um, approach our faith with just these commandments without really um, incorporating them into our own life. So we're not here to argue about the Ten Commandments. We're arguing about how the t Ten Commandments affect our world and each other. So again, uh, we need to have faith to do that. <laughs> Apologists should indeed have these virtues. Um, sometimes they make the mistake of believing a set of propositions in a philosophy of life. But faith has to deal with recognizing God's authority. So again, it's not what I think that I believe. It's what God has uh, revealed that I need to know and also then come to believe. So just because I believe in something doesn't mean it's the truth. So we have to be very careful here. Sometimes our motive of credibility uh, centers on that we are not themselves that we believe or ultimately why we believe, but rather that God reveals them as truth. I just said that. Because of our humanness and being subject to error, we can miss the point of revealed truth. We can get up there and argue our head off and again, be completely missing the point the church is trying to teach. So again, we have to realize that we're human. We do make mistakes. We're not, we're not going to know everything on this side of heaven. Therefore, we have to pray and trust God is going to act in this and bring it to completion. An act of faith is a belief in what we do. I, I preached about this yesterday. That an act of faith is a belief in what we do. We, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty. We believe in all these truths, but again, we live them out. So it's not complete just being on paper. We have to live them out. And there has to be that harmony between the two. When one doesn't match the other, then we're not going to be an apologist, an effective one. So we have to live out what we believe. So again, um, having faith is not just um, casually accepting the truths of the church. It's not based on uh, blind faith, but rather, uh, and it's also not just um, arguing and proving. Rather, it's like I said, believing and living it out. The next um, theological virtue is that of hope. Um, turning to God in prayers tied to hope. Hope is a virtue where we desire God as our highest good and trusting and relying on him, not our own powers. 
participation in apologetics expresses um, some ideals of salvation. So we're moving closer um, to God in knowledge, experience, and growth toward spiritual perfection. So again, in prayer, the more time we spend, and the more time we spend in God's presence and in the theological virtues, we're going to become closer to God. And coming closer to God gives us a knowledge of him, an experience of him, and then the spiritual perfection as we move closer and closer and closer to God. So sins against hope <clears throat> is one of despair and also presumption. Those are the two things that hope is able to overcome, despair and presumption. Presumption expects God to save us without our willingness to use the means that he established. I have people that come into confession all the time and just presume that they're being forgiven by God without them living out what they're saying. I'm going to amend my life, sin no more, blah, blah, blah. And then they're back 24 hours later. Father, bless me for... <laughs> Move on, girl. Um, again, it's presumption that God is because he's all loving and all kind. And phew, That's not what the two thieves at, on either side of the cross point to us about. God saves one because of their heart being in the right direction, and the other one is cast away because um, he's turning away from God. So again, we should not expect God just to wave a magic wand over our lives. They have to be in conformity with the means that he has established, which is the teaching of the church, the scriptures, and all the dogmas. So when we sin, we judge ourselves capable of pleasing God by our own powers or what we think God's goodness will save us regardless of what we do or do not do. Despair, on the other hand, is um, the opposite of hope in that it either denies that God can save us even if we use the means he has given us. So people can walk the way of the faith, they can live in the church, they can follow the commandments and still fall into despair. So again, um, they have to... Um, Realize that God is in charge, and we don't want to um, deny that he has saved us once and for all. So again, it's putting it back in God's control. Despair is um, a more emotional state than it is an act of the will. To disregard God's power and goodness. <clears throat> so for an apologist, this figures in when we rely on our own power and intelligence to produce the truth, not trusting in God as the source. So we have to be very careful. We look with hope to everything that God has revealed so that we can attain that um, to eternal life. That's what motivates us. We have hope in God's word, his actions, his power, not our own. Um, personal fail failures can lead to despair. So we need to foster hope on what our... Um, but our hope is found in Christ Jesus. So somebody who comes to me who's very um, in a despairing state, again, I, I just tell them, hey, pray for the virtue of hope. It, it's what combats that, allowing God to once again enter into their life as being in charge. Since God has promised to be with us always, in that truth we know will set us free, we have to stay connected to God through prayer and all these other habits. God's gift is not about us, but we want to foster hope, this virtue of hope, um, in God rather than hope in ourselves. Clarity. The greatest of the... Oh, charity. I'm sorry. Boy, my coffee. Charity is the final um, virtue that we look at today, and it's the, the greatest of the three theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity. <clears throat> so again, um, we approach uh, apologetics out of love for God. That has to be the basis of why we're doing what we're doing, why we're saying what we're saying. What we're trying to convert people to is our love of God and have them share his truth. So again, we must seek the right ends by the right means. The right end must be the charitable way of seeking the other's good. So we want to bring them to salvation. That should be our motive, not winning the argument. 
So charity forms faith, and belief leads to action, and forms faith by what we do and say. So seeking the right end by the right means means an effective apologist can believe that God is worth being loved above all things. Therefore, we invite in a charitable way others to pursue the truth. He who does not love his brother whom he can see cannot love God whom he does not see. So St. Paul's letter about love is a, a wonderful example of how we should um, conduct ourselves as an apologist. <clears throat> and we can see what charity is not. Charity. Okay, remember that God loves those with whom we argue. We're all God's children. They also are made in his image and likeness. Love of God and neighbor are intertwined. So we love other people, but we don't have to like them. And we can also like others without loving them. So everybody I like in the room, I don't love. It's that kind of notion. One has to deal with feelings, and the other has to deal with the act of the will. So um, 1 Corinthians 13, again, for an apologist, um, he is kind, he is patient, he is never jealous, he doesn't put on ears, blah, 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 blah. On it goes. And that's the same thing for an apologist. So in closing this um, book, again, we have had, had a long journey with it. But at the same time, it's been very, very powerful in allowing us to argue our faith and bring people to salvation. So, um, you know, just in, I was thinking this morning, um, you know, who could use this book? And the person that came to mind was Rick Santorum. He could use this book a little bit. He's a good man. He has uh, great debates for the faith, but at the same time, maybe going about them by the wrong means. And so he needs to be a little more effective in that bringing people along with him. But again, that's what this book is for. It's for all of us. It's for all of us to maybe um, look at how we can become effective apologists. So those are the seven effective habits. And again, um, as they say at the end of the cartoons, that's all, folks. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. May Almighty God bless all of you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a great day.